All right. Welcome to episode 32 of Libertarian Crusaders. Um, joined by Joe Pascal today. Of course, we have Kurt and uh, Cal as usual. And uh, so um, Joe is the vice chair of the State Libertarian Party of Virginia. And uh, I'm the, if you don't know, I'm the treasurer of the State Party of Virginia. So uh, it makes sense that I was able to set this up, of course. Um, but uh, welcome, Joe. Um, appreciate you coming on and uh, appreciate you joining us. I'm just curious to you know, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Tell everybody uh, how you came to this, this point where you're willing to uh, join the State Party of the Libertarian Party of Virginia and uh, what's going on. Oh, well, essentially, I was raised in a, my mom was a gold border Republican. You know, it was her age. My stepdad was like 13 years older than my mom. And he got drafted into the army. So he like, he literally just couldn't stand the government. He figured, you know, they, they raped him for part of his life, which is agreeable. I mean, it's indentured servitude, whether we want to talk about it like that or not. But so he never voted or anything. But so I was raised in a very libertarian esque household. So I've always been a libertarian. I think the first person I, I the first person I ever voted for was in 1992 when I was Ross. You know, um, so you know, construction. It's always you know. I don't know if, if anybody's ever been involved in construction. It's very libertarian na in nature. The people are very free loving people. You know, we talk. I see people all the time that quit their job and go across the street for a dollar more, not because they're going to make that much more money, but it's a principle thing, right? They want, they can pay us more. They're willing to pay us more than you're willing to pay us. or we're going over there. You know? I file that uh, you didn't graduate from high school. They're mostly uh, self-taught. I was a uh, home. Well, my real dad died when I was 16. So I kind of got a little rebellious in school. So my stepfather took me out of school. So that was fighting and getting in trouble. How can you survive without a public indoctrination degree, Joe? That's right. I don't know. I, I got lucky, I guess. <laughs> I find that, uh, that you also homeschool. Yes, we homeschool. And um, we lived in Montana for 10 years and moved back. Um, the whole deal is, is it's, the, it's like you said, it's indoctrination, right? We, we get... Where public school system, the way it is now, it's spent, it's more of a social gathering and more of an indoctrination. I mean, it's, you can't say this to your fellow students because it's offensive. Or, so they start social justice training with these kids from kindergarten up, right? I mean, it's a, and there's a difference to being able to, to learn to function in society and, and learn manners and all, but when you can't even have an opinion in a public school system is what it's come down to it. Your opinion. Is wrong. So they re-educate these kids to where they, they even think that that, that kind of opinion is wrong. It's, it's socially wrong. And they, you know, all the crap. I mean, you know, they, they got, and it's fine. I mean, I guess I look at things a little different because you take a kid after eighth grade, you can pretty much figure if they're college material or they need, they're probably going to go off and do something else. I mean, and you can focus on that more at home, right? I mean, it's the basics, reading, writing, reading, writing, arithmetic. But then like my kids were more focused on technical skills. And now my son, my oldest son at um, 23, heck, he, he left at 18. He went to work construction. He built windmills. And that's what he's been doing. And, um, you know, I don't do windmill work. It's still construction, but he kind of went off on his own side of that. And he does good. He make, He's 23 years old. He makes $110,000 a year in construction. He's got no college debt. Nothing. I mean, so, you know, this is how I do it. You see uh, the future of schooling with all this uh, corona madness going on. And we've come to find that public schools are apparently not uh, essential. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, the thing is, for us homeschoolers around the country, this hasn't changed. Anything. You know, it's just, it's kind of, you know, the biggest thing we miss is not being able to go out to, to eat, you know, out to a restaurant 
or something during this. Other than that, surprisingly, even though our governor is a tyrant, the state of Virginia hasn't been as bad as other states. There's been a lot like tractor supply companies open, Home Depots are open, I, you know, drive throughs are open. So, you know, it could have been a lot worse, which it never should have happened nationwide like it did anyway. I mean, that was ridiculous. I get it. If, if you're worried about going outside, then there's plenty of services to offer to people that don't want to go to these places without making everybody do it. You know, so... Have you seen the Harvard uh, pieces attacking homeschooling? They think they, I think they've done three of them now. Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff attacking homeschooling. Uh, it's crazy because they don't want, they don't want free thinkers. They, they want to control the way we think. You, you know, it's, if, if we're being homeschooled, we can't, think the way they want we can't group think you know they want group think and the group think mentality they start grooming these kids from day one to go to these colleges and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars of, for useless degree and i'm not saying i'm not against college i really never have been but you know probably 45 50 percent of people go to college get degrees in liberal arts or, or something they'll never use in the real world. It's okay to get a liberal arts degree if you plan on being a liberal arts teacher or... Anything that ends with the word uh, studies needs to be uh, cut. Yeah. Gender <laughs> studies. I'm against, <laughs> you I'm know, against all schooling. Do garage <laughs> education again. Get back to how you teach people oh, stuff. Agreed. But I also blame the government on that just as much as the schools and ain't the schools. It's just like we've allowed these schools to give all these college loans out to all these kids for years. The government has allowed all these. It's just like letting your kids get subsidize it. Yeah. It's like letting your kids get away with, with stuff for, for years and then try to all of a sudden say, well, you can't, can't do that anymore. I know last week it was fine, but damn it, we're not letting you do it. No more retired. So, you know, you can't almost you can't blame all the colleges for taking that government subsidized money because it was handed. I blame the government for doing it so. So they fed it. They're just as guilty as the schools themselves. It's like with the stimulus. You know, I don't blame people for taking the twelve hundred dollars. I blame the government for printing all this pretend money and then just distributing it throughout the economy. I mean, I look at I look at good jobs and um successful people. And I see a lot. I mean, I run into these guys in uh, West Virginia who own their own home and they're like 24 and they do construction. And I, I can't help but think like they built their home and they had, they had a job and you think how many kids who come out of college would love to be in that situation where they actually are building some capital uh, and have some assets on their balance sheet as opposed to just $200,000 in debt. I mean, it seems, um, Seems tragic. Yeah. Well, see, and that's, you know, and I don't like, because I always laugh. I laugh and joke about it a lot of times with the boomer, you know, everybody talks about the boomers, you know. But here's the thing. It's that generation that started it, because I remember when I was in school, and I'm probably a little older. I'm 48, so I know I'm a little older than you guys. But the problem's always been, when I was in school, I remember teachers telling kids, you don't want to dig ditches your whole life. Uh, you know, so that's just that part of it, right? You know, you, so it's, we have made a society where manual labor is beneath us. But yet, and still the same people, that's what's the sad thing has always been is they say, well, you know, you got to get a college degree and all this, or you're not going to be anything. You're going to work in a factory your whole life. But damn, we don't need no immigrants coming in here or taking our jobs. Well, what jobs? You mean the jobs that you told your kids not to take? Because <laughs> It was beneath them and nobody else wants to do it. I mean, is, is that those jobs you, in heavy construction? Latinos control the, the dirt work part of it, the concrete portion, the insulation and paint. That's how it's been. Why? Because nobody wanted to get into those trades because they didn't pay money. They weren't glamorous. You know, the iron worker guys, you know, they would like to work 350 feet in the air and that's their thing you know it, yeah, i would say like even without immigration latinos it's not as if like no one will ever do it again like there's this uh yeah. somebody was talking about like 
uh, even closing the borders in Mexico saying we want to close the borders against the U S for the first time. And people, <laughs> who's going to, you know, tend to the foreign. So it's interesting how like they always look at like even minorities, like th that only they can do these menial jobs. They don't look at it. Like what about these CEOs or they look at them and say, well, who's going to serve my food or who's going to pick my food. But at the same time, after you have to remember that America uh, was founded by farm farmers. <laughs> uh, who's going to pick the crops? Uh, it ain't no thing. Americans have for a long time, up to like 70% of the profession here in this country, were nothing but farmers. Um, well, I mean, you know, Thomas Jefferson's dream. I mean, that's what, you know, Thomas Jefferson's dream was to keep us an agricultural-based society. Whether, you know, we look back on it, was he maybe, you know, he never could probably foresee the Industrial Revolution. So you know, I would expect that would have changed if, if he was a few years later down the road, but he realized the value of people working the land and basing the economy that way. Right. And you have a farm I, I read about, right? Yeah. I've got, it's a small one. It's not a big farm, but you know, it's. What's with uh, like, like people see like farming is a good retirement thing. Uh, like all kinds of, oh, everyone, like even like soldiers, like Julius Caesar's like, oh, you know, I just want my plot of land out there conquering the world. And I just want to farm and grow my crops. Uh, Thanos and the uh, Avengers <laughs> he went to a planet and became a farmer. Uh, That's right. I guess there's something like you can see the, the raw strength that you put into the earth and the bounty that you create and, and pull back. I think, I guess that's, that's the interest. I don't know about the, but like, if this is you and a couple of your kids, you have, you have to wake up every morning, <laughs> um, you know, milk the cow. And it's like, everything has to be like every, every hour is kind of taken up. I imagine. I don't know. Well, I'll see. And that's the different thing about farming. So I think that where people have lost people, a lot of people tend to think, well, if you're going to be a sustaining farm, you have to, you got to have a milk cow and you got to have this and you got to have all of these little parts and pieces, but you don't. Because if I raise tomatoes, say, or melons or whatever, right now I'm working garlic, you know, we're going to raise some gourmet garlic and all that. But there's another farmer up the road that has those other things, right? So within a farming community, you have, you can still be self-sustaining without spending a lot of money because I can trade my tomatoes for meat or, and then, you know, or trade meat for, for milk or something, and, you know, so you, you can still be self-sustaining without having to raise all of those things yourself. And that's, and that would be a healthy trade economy because that's, that would encourage people to raise more than they need. So they'd have stuff to trade to get other things. And I think more and more people are looking into this right now too, uh, given the yeah. supply chain problems they're, they're realizing, well, all that food that just magically shows up in your grocery store, it's, it's not necessarily there right now. You know, some of it's not, not on the shelves. I mean, I, you just walk through and I, I see a couple of different types of toilet paper, you know, there's some, yeah. but anyway, so the, the, I, what do you think about, I mean, I go to the home Depot and there's, a lot of stuff that's missing in the gardening section and you're surprised. Uh, what kind of advice might you give to like, I'm, I'm just getting started doing that gardening and doing some vegetables here and there, but what, what kind of advice would you give somebody who's just starting out at that? I mean, the first thing is you kind of got to sit down and say, how much will my family consume of whatever asparagus or whatever it is a year? And then raise two years worth for that first year because if you get a bad year, or you get a crop, a bug, or something comes in and kills your crop, and you have a year that you couldn't raise anything, you're going to come short. If you always raise more than you need, you've got extra for trade value. You've got you can it, of course, but you also have that reserve if something ever does happen, a drought or any of that kind of stuff. But you just kind of go with what you use. Like spices are easy too. There's so many spices now. You you know, you can raise about any spice you want. Um, tomato. Actually, last year and the year before, Virginia became Virginia's number one cash crop is now tomato. Hmm. I don't think a lot of people know that. Virginia's got a seven hundred billion dollar a year agricultural revenue. 
Uh, how do you raise steak? I haven't had a good steak in uh, 61 days. <laughs> well, that's the, you know, farming here is not too bad because you can use one cow per acre. You can, you can set it up one cow per acre is what you need. And, you know, the, I think what people don't understand how that beef business works is you keep your heifers and you kill off or butcher the calves, you know, after they get seven, eight, nine hundred pounds before she calves again. And so through the winter months, say you're only having to hay the pregnant heifer. You're not having to feed a young cow and the heifer. You know, so it's like, uh, you know, we have great examples here in Virginia. We have uh, Joe Salatin of Shenandoah Valley, uh, right? There's uh, a lot of things that we can do towards being so sustainable again. And I think some of the positive things out of here is uh, people having to realize that and research that and realizing not all this is, will always be there. Um, so recently you won the uh, vice president's uh, seat for the Libertarian Party of Virginia. Uh, I was, uh, was rooting for you because I went to the convention. I hosted the, uh, the last libertarian after party for the convention. I remember. <laughs> uh, I didn't go because we had to get back home, but I uh, remember about that. Uh, whereabouts in Virginia are, are you again? South, near South. Well, right outside of the town of South Hill. All right. But I'm in Lunenburg County, Mecklenburg County borders, North Carolina. I'm just. Right. What's what's the deal with Bristol down there? Because it's on North Carolina. The city's split in two. So if North Carolina has like their own uh, coronavirus lockdown. Do you That's just, on Tennessee side, Bristol, Tennessee. Right. Do you just like step on the other side? It's like, well, can't touch me. Virginia. Oh, that's true. Bristol's got um, survey monuments in the middle of the street. If you <laughs> right in the middle of the street, the yellow line is um, is the state line. It's, uh, but there's a couple more towns, actually. There's uh, Bluefield is the same way. Bluefield, Virginia and West Virginia. It's not quite like Bristol, but half the town is in West Virginia, half the town is in. What an example then to show that you can still live in a city and have your different policies for one another right. that don't overlap. <laughs> Bristol's always had that. I think they've got some kind of joint city council thing. It, it's weird. and mm. They've got their own system down there but it's always worked for bristol bristol you know always been that way what do you see um the future for the libertarian party recently amash just dropped out right i guess uh he saw the might of the hornberger and feared uh further debates with him and had to bow out respectfully uh, I, I think amash um figured out that um that didn't want to waste millions and millions of dollars, you know, running against Trump because, you know, the cult of Trump, you know, it's got a big following. I mean, you know, and I think he realized that it would be a waste of money and resources to do it. Yeah. Wow. I think he's uh he's the type of guy that, I mean, also, I think he took one look at the situation this year in particular for the LP, and it was just like, it's it's going to be difficult. I mean, they're we're doing it all, on, or this whole president and vice president thing online. I think he knew he would have won, probably. Well, probably. And so he well, was just been like, some animosity toward him, I expect, because they said, oh, if this had been an in-person convention, we need to never won. You know, I can hear that now. So, um, yeah. And then there were some thoughts that I've heard. I mean. There was some stuff that Nick wanted the online convention because he felt that that's how Amash could get the um, get the nomination. I just think it's uh, it's been a wild show so far. <laughs> uh, I just saw on Facebook that they canceled the the convention, of course, and I've heard that Adam Kokush has been crying about this for uh, he's been a mess because thinking that Amash is coming out of nowhere and, and he fears he'll just take the seat out uh, right underneath him. Um, so I think it's like that. Let me turn these damn lights are on a timer. Emotion. Oh yeah. Yep. The, um, so yes, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, the LP is the, LP. the LNC and the LP has always been the way it is. Right? So Kurt, so, Kurt, you had a question regarding Kurt comes from, you know, volunteerist background. So what, what was your question? 
how can we get the LP to not waste so many man hours like doing political circle jerking and do more like on the street activism and outreach? See, my thing, my thing about that all is, is what I've always felt there's a problem within the libertarian movement is they have a problem identifying candidates and activists. So we'll take Vermin, right? Vermin's a great activist. Oh, he is. He's a, he's a smart guy, great activist. But we don't need him as a candidate. I'm sorry. That's my personal opinion. Agreed. But I wouldn't say well, he doesn't need to be involved with the party because he does great activism, right? He makes it so funny. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's the issue, right? We we tend not to separate the two. A lot of our better activists become candidates. So now they're not being activists, they're being candidates. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's a big problem about getting our message out. Because we can, you know, I mean, we can have good candidates that are great candidates, but they are crappy activists. <laughs> they don't need to be good activists. They need to be good camera. I mean, they need to be good in front of a camera. They need to be good with the press and all that to be that candidate, right? I I, I concur with the uh, Kurt that there should be more of a focus um, outside of the years because it seems like all the option to want to do good and propel liberty generally ever happens like every four years, right? When, when there's an election time and then things kind of die down. Um, and there's like, there's no activity or interest to kind of reach out again. It seems like sometimes the interest is just a political one, um, not a grassroots one for other kind of social issues and, and causes. I also have always thought that we should name our presidential candidates two years before the election. Like we should name our presidential candidate in 2022 since, you know, a big part of our party problem is raising money, getting ballot access. Um, if we gave those candidates two years to do that, you know, they would have that much of a leg up because, you know, a candidate's only got six or eight months here to get ready. There's only so much they're going to be willing to do. And they go, oh, I may not get the nomination. So they may not, an activist and volunteers may not want to help that particular one. So you look at Larry Sharp, every time Larry Sharp runs, he takes like 40% of the available volunteers in the party because people go to them. Um, you know, that's a big problem. Yeah, and it's it, one of it, just like expanding. Problem. No, it ain't against Larry. I'm just saying that's how everything works. So we have a limited amount of volunteers that can afford to be volunteers. We got a lot of people that like to be volunteers that just can't afford to do it. And Right, we have jobs. <laughs> well, I mean, I, then that's fine. You know, it's not, we're not the GOP or the Democrats that have got millions of dollars sitting around that we can pay these campaign staffers to canvas and do all this stuff all the time. Most of ours comes from volunteers doing it. Yeah, it's a, lot of, a lot of volunteer hours, like, you know, even with major positions in the party, like the LNC chairman. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And that's why I say we need to give these candidates and all a longer time. They need to be able to pull a lot of those volunteers together and have them longer term to, to get funds and get this ballot access. I thought in terms of the most amazing activism in the past 10 years that I've seen was, uh, I wasn't there for the whole thing, but the uh, Richmond Second Amendment um, protests, you know, and just seeing all these people from all over the place come in and protest. I thought that was a great uh, moment for the LP to say, this is our issue. This is the thing that we're going to be the most radical on because we're better than everybody else on it. And uh, so I thought that was like, that's the type of thing I'd like to see a lot more of. And it would be great if the Libertarian Party got just people wearing Libertarian Party shirts with ARs on their, you know, on their shoulder or something. It's something like that. It's just great marketing, I would think. Well, see, I, and that's one of the reasons I ran for vice chair. I mean, I was going to run for chair, I ran for chair first, of course. One of the reasons was I was a little disappointed about, um, I would have expected to see libertarians at every county board of supervisor meetings during that, uh, during that deal. I myself went to a few, went to the one for our county. I presented the, re- the resolution to Lunenburg. 
to the Board of Supervisors that got signed. I would have expected those things to be full of libertarians and everyone, you know, getting up speaking. That's how you get, because then you, that's how you can build alliances with the other groups that are pro gun that may not fall into the libertarian spectrum. And just like, and to turn them into libertarians, you know, like that's how we get the numbers that we can canvas down the road is because those people become libertarians and say, yeah, this is the most radically pro gun party. And that's what right. Even, even right now is a great moment for the libertarian party to even to step up with, you see how uh, barbers are getting harassed by the goons of governors. And I think now is a great time to see if there are any businesses in Virginia that want to stay open. Uh, but are afraid to be shut down. And if they need some security or media attention, uh, contact the Libertarian Party. Uh, we'll send some people down there. I think um, <clears throat> there are some armed people that prevented the cops from arresting a barber recently. Um, you know, I think Richmond uh, paved the way on that gun rally day for a lot of other people and militia groups to be a lot more ballsy uh, in their confrontation with this. And I think that's uh, something to kind of keep riding that wave. Well, we have to. I mean, and that's the big thing. We we have momentum, and we have to keep that momentum, right? Otherwise, we shut down, and it's like, oh, we won't say nothing else to the next session until they talk about more gun growth. But meanwhile, it should be all along, every time, weekly. There should be, to me, in the state of Virginia, there should be a, a gun rally everywhere once a week, somewhere in the state. You know, rolling over. Yeah. I mean, it should be somewhere. And um, VCDL, see, Van Cleve hates the Libertarian Party. He may pander to us a little bit, but he, he hates us. I've talked to him a few times. He, he detests us. I mean, I think there's some history there, too, though. I mean, in terms of good, so there's been a couple moments where some good Libertarian candidates were running on the Republican Party. And, yeah. and, and he's probably like, what? You know, Ken Cuccinelli was like as pro gun as they come. And, and so there's, you know, for whether you, whether you feel that way or not, I guess that that's where it probably comes from. But yeah, they, they always blame the libertarians for spoiling. What they don't realize is there's a bunch of pro gun people who voted libertarian who were dissatisfied with like the person who ran in my district was Republican, but she was anti-gun, you know, she was deadly well, anti-gun. So, well, I mean, it's just like, I have problems with Amanda Chase because she's pro gun. But she's really anti-liberty. I mean, she's pushed no less than six mandatory sentence guideline bills through, you know, tried to push through. I mean, she's all for an authoritarian type state. She, she's pro-gun. Great. You know, thanks for your help with that. But I'm not going to be on your side when you start talking about mandatory sentence and guidelines and for everything. Because then, just because the Republicans wouldn't say lock people up for bringing a gun to the Capitol after you set these guidelines in place, what's going to happen when the Democrats come in. And then now you got 10 years of prison just because you did this. So we have to be careful on all that. Right. That that's always a problem with the NRA too, you know, and and that's why gun owners of America exists, I guess, is because they're, they're, they're not as uh, pro government in, in many other respects. So I had a, I had a question. Um, I don't know if this is an unrelated to gun issue, but, um, just as being, having been in, uh, the development accounting, real estate accounting and working with construction managers, I'm curious about your experience with, um, safety on a construction site. And I noticed, I noticed in one of your prior interviews, you mentioned safety and OSHA, and those are not necessarily the same thing, right? Uh, you got safety and then you got government rules and regulations. So how do, how do you balance those two things? And, you know, obviously everybody wants safety though. <laughs> well, I'd say that's, I had a conversation about this today an actually interesting conversation. Um, so yeah, safety is paramount because I mean, it means you get work. So there's something called a TRIR rate in construction, a total recordable incident rate. Okay, so one per every 200,000 man hours, you know, that's how they set it. So if your TRIR rate is worse than a 0.8, ExxonMobil and the big companies like that won't even let you bid work. 
So it pays for you to keep your injuries down. On the industrial side, OSHA is nothing because I mean, everybody goes above and beyond OSHA. Commercial is a little different. Commercial, they, they're, that's where most of your injuries in construction live is in commercial and residential. Now, I'm not a fan of OSHA on the enforcement side. I do believe that OSHA should be reworked to where basically every year they do it like ASME, American Society for Mechanical Engineers. Every couple of years or whatever, they have a conference and companies, engineers and all this, they put all this together and they put a guideline that this is, this is what they are. There's no per se enforcement of it. So they let the states and stuff handle that or insurance company. Here's the bigger part of it. So you could take OSHA and put the government out of the enforcement side of it altogether. Use them just to set a guideline of these are the guidelines we need to go by. And let the insurance companies handle it. Because then the insurance company is going to come in here and say, hey, guess what? I'm not insuring you because you're not following those guidelines. Tough shit. See you later, guys. Find somebody else. I mean, that's how it could work. There needs to be something. And I don't think it need, doesn't need to necessarily be a government controlled entity. But it's, it would be more like a, constitu- a safety constitution, goes, per se, right? It's, these are the guidelines. We all agree that we're going to abide by these guidelines. And the insurance companies are the ones that say, hey, we're not going to insure you if you don't follow these guidelines. And then they can send people out to check and audit jobs, just like anything else. I mean, right, it's like I, they I don't think much. that no safety, we all, you know, there, there is some bad actors in construction. I've seen it my whole life, right? There's some bad act. The problem is you get people off the street that new into construction and don't know anything. And they don't know that you're not supposed to work 20 feet in the air without a safety harness just because their boss told them to, and they, they've never been involved in that. So it's the training portion, but you got to have somewhere to start. I mean, I think this country has done well for a long time without an OSHA, right? I think uh, we've done great monumental buildings and uh, the Empire State Building without OSHA. Uh, I think a lot of this stuff is kind of hampering and I think you make a good comment, uh, and think it was in, in editorials about how we look right now at what's happening with the lockdown situation. And there's a lot of restrictions being lifted and we're finding that, you know, we never needed those to begin with, right? Every kind of restriction is, it's a potential fine. It's a potential tax on somebody and it's an impediment to business and economy and trade. So I think, uh, could you talk a, a little about what you've been seeing in terms of restrictions being lifted, maybe in construction or elsewhere? Well, see, um, and that's, so here, so when I come into work, before I get to work, I've got to fill out a questionnaire. You know, do I have any symptoms? Have I been to these type of places or whatever? I have to fill it out and then I submit it and it, it's online, you know, so. Then they get it to their server, so whoever the powers that be can see it. Well, then when I get to work, as soon as I get into the gate, I get a temperature scan. Okay. Then every time I move from like building to building or around my site, I get another temperature scan. They, you know, cloth face masks are mandatory. So, and then if we've already had people get COVID or have COVID, and they found out within thirty minutes that that person, so they shut that area down. They call in the sanit- sanitizing crew and they sanitize it, keep everybody out of the area and we go back to work. So, but now here's where the Mitch, and I'll bring this up, Mitch McConnell wants to right now remove all liability for companies with this COVID. If somebody gets COVID, he wants to remove all liability. The only reason that these companies are doing this kind of stuff like they're doing now with me is because it's considered an OSHA recordable illness if you get it at work. So to counteract that, they're make they're doing jumping through leaps and bounds to make sure nobody gets sick. Mm. Yeah, you know, so there's 
it's just that balancing act, right? So if there's no punishment at all, then they can say, hell, I don't care if it gets sick or not, I ain't gonna pay. But if there's that risk, that risk that if I don't do the right thing, and 20 people get sick, they can turn around and sue me. You, you get what I'm saying? I mean, I think it's that kind of drives them to do better. You know, we all want to think companies are going to do the right thing, but we know there's bad actors out there that could care less. That's a good point. Yeah. I guess there'd be some people who try to take advantage of the situation. Um, and that's a civil thing. So, I mean, that's a civil thing. The government has no business involved in civil, civil litigation. And that's what I'm getting at. But McConnell wants to push forth a bill to remove the ability for somebody to sue civilly in court for something. And it, the government has no business involved in that. Because right now, the risk of po potentially being sued is driving them to go above and beyond to, to address these concerns. Yeah, picking winners and losers, you know. It's like our friends, well, now they're protected from, you know, getting sued for this. And uh, no matter how guilty they may be, I mean, maybe they could have just been, oh, well, you know, they screwed up a little bit or they did it on purpose. They got people sick on purpose. There's any, you know, there's a range. <laughs> yeah, but now you can't even decide that in court because, you know, there is a negligence in court, right? There is a, like here, I think somebody would have a hard time suing for negligence on this project because of everything they go through. You know, you can okay, it did happen. You did get sick, but it wasn't from negligence. It was, you know, something happened. You, you got in contact with somebody. And for all you know, it could have been somebody outside of work. Point being, but if, if you take that out of the equation, then they can be straight negligent. I, I went, wow, well, I'm going to pay a nurse. So, you know, we're paying medics. 30 bucks an hour just to sit there and take people's temperature. And we got 10 or 12 of them around the job. If there was no risk involved, then they go, shit, I'm paying that. Why do I need to pay all this? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I mean, so there's. Uh, you Removing know. liability from big corps has been an ongoing agenda for, uh, I don't know, 60 years, I think now though. So. And when the unions like were strong, do. Because that's how OSHA was created. So when you were talking about, Cal, that we did well without OSHA, we did when we had a strong union involved. Because the unions would make sure, you know, they, that's when they used to go on strikes. In Virginia, they used to strike at these coal mines and stuff for working conditions many, many times. And that's what built it up to start OSHA. Uh uh, pro union uh, strike uh, breaker myself actually I'm on the other side of that. <laughs> no, I mean I, I I grew up in a trade union. Trade unions don't strike. They they've always gave up the right to strike because you know plant unions. I've done both sides. I've worked non union and union. But what I was getting at is what built up to OSHA was that that that's what the unions want conditions better working conditions over the year built up to the creation of it uh yeah they created a their frankenstein monster it said oh, well once the government got involved you know it just morphed from there but the initial thought process is kind of chicken or the egg right? so by creating osha they and the department of labor in general they they pretty much took the need of having unions out of the equation. So they got rid of the union, but they created this other bureaucracy in the same portion. It may be just as bad as you. It, you know what I mean? Because that was the whole point of, oh, the Department of Labor, oh, we've got rules now, government rules of OSHA, MSHA, all these rules. So you don't really need a union for working conditions. The government guarantees we have to follow these work. Thank government goodness. Yeah, centralized <laughs> controls there to solve it for us. But, but you get what I'm I mean, you, you get what I'm saying. So it kind of cookie cutter you know, just the needs for that. You know, chop all the edges laws, right off. All right. Minimum wage laws came up. All that kind of stuff came involved with that. That was all well, we don't need unions anymore because we're protected. The, the government protects it. Think of the children. <laughs> so OSHA and MSHA are 100 percent self-funded. They're not taxpayer funded. So the reason they go out and find fines to find companies is because they're self-funded. 
they have to fund themselves, and the only way they get money is from fines. Uh, uh, crooks have families to feed too, you know. Yeah, but see, that's the problem. They don't go after the bad actors. The, the bad actors, most of the time, are the little. Uh, yeah, I'm saying OSHA is. Crooks have to feed too. <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. But, but I'm saying a lot of the bad actors in construction are the smaller companies that can't afford proper safety training and all that. OSHA doesn't go after those guys. They only go after the big corporations that can afford to pay a half a million dollar fine. Mm. That's the problem. Yeah. Like, um, you know, the cops don't pull you over. Um, if you're driving a piece of crap, you know, they drive like they, they'd much rather pull over the guy who is not going to cause any problems and clearly can pay the fine and just leave, you know, rather than yeah. have to like deal with a major altercation and, uh, potentially, get, you know, in physical confrontation or something, you know, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's the, so there is some, you know, you got to find out, I guess, you know, whenever we have an injury at work, a major injury, we've done. We do root cause analysis, what caused that. So in that frame of thinking, it's what caused OSHA to be the way OSHA is. You got to go back to the root cause, of it, right? It was people like Rockefeller and all that originally and poor working conditions for people way, way back facilitated the unions being created, which eventually led to the creation of OSHA. So you know, there's got to be middle ground, and I feel that OSHA <laughs> dialectic be that's been highlighted for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's been, yeah, you know, I just think it needs to be structured different. No enforcement, maybe just a group of contractors and everybody, state getting together, setting a set of rules, and let the insurance companies take care of it. And then I think it'd be better for everybody. Right. That's that's really it. It's the insurance and the liability. Uh, mm -hmm. Want to cover that? Then. If they don't, you're held responsible for that, right? As the employer, right? So, and insurance company would kind of make sure, like, look, if you want kind of uh, uh, coverage, you got to do this, this, and that. It's like our car insurance. If we get in two or three accidents, how long is our car insurance keeping us? Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same I, principle. Right? I could see, and I could see absolutely like a group of skilled um, workers getting together and saying, here's our rules and here's our rules. If you want to work with us and we're the best at this, you know, and uh, those other guys are crap and we're good. So hire us and we'll get it done much faster than they will or, or what have you. I can see that, um, that if you want to call it a union, you know, um, we'll, and we also follow all, and we have a low, uh, you know, incident rating, injury rating or whatever. So, you know, I could see, I could see those being selling points. It's just the problem is when the government gets involved, Oh, they're saying all of a sudden you got the labor relations board, the national Re labor relations board telling everybody, well, here, this is the way it's going to be, you know? So <laughs> that's what I struggle with. Have the non-essentials telling the essentials, uh, <laughs> do their business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll check, come but... to the hour here. It was uh, last uh, points you wanted to bring up. Oh, you talking to me? Sorry. Oh. Uh, to Joe. Oh, yeah, and to you guys too. In terms of uh, asking Joe Pasha. Well, we got. Uh, you know, I did want to talk about this tr three trillion dollar stimulus bill we just put out. Right. It's, you don't want another Trump bucket check. <laughs> yeah. So this is my personal opinion. I mean, take it for what you. Want. So what I think twenty twenty is going to turn out is so that if Pelosi's nothing, she's She's not stupid. I mean, Pelosi is very calculating, maybe evilly, but I mean, so she put, they get this $3 trillion stimulus bill, on, bill out here and it's got a lot of fat in it, but it also has got a lot of, you know, stimulus checks for the working Americans that have been out of work. The Republicans and senators shoot themselves in the foot in an election year. 23 seats are up for election in the, um, GOP Senate. Um, yeah, you know, how are they going to go back to their um, home regions and say, hey, um, well, we voted against that. We don't think you guys need money. You know, so she's smart. I mean, she's real smart on that because they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. They'll lose a lot of the corporate in vote, you know, probably if they sign off on it. 
you know, but they lose a lot more people, regular people votes down in the bottom if they if they just trash it. I'm rooting for them to do it just because it debases the dollar even more, which makes my gold and silver worth more. So yeah, I agree. More power to them. I mean, but I'm saying, you know, that's funny because what I think is going to happen in 2020, I think I personally think Trump will still be president, honestly. And I believe that was not ever the goal. That's why Biden's up there. I don't think the goal of the Democrats was ever to take the White House. They want the Senate. That's their crown jewel. They want the Senate and Congress controlled under, under the Democrats. That's what they want. And I believe that's going to happen. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. Hmm. I agree. And I see it. And, uh, and Trump silenced the dissident right. Like they're, uh, whatever, they're appeased by him because he feigns that he appeals to the right wing. So there's no. I mean, yeah, his, the problem is most of the Trump, the hardcore Trumpers, and I'm not talking about people that just voted for Trump. Anyway, I'm talking about the ones that paint their trucks and cars and houses, the Donald Trump stuff, you know, the MAGA crowd. You know, we're talking about people that probably never voted before 2016. They are very politically uneducated. They they like what he says and they like what Sean Hannity tells them to like on Fox News. But other than that, they don't know anything else about politics. Yeah. Yeah. They like the, they like the, um, strong guy who's going to save us, you know, populism. He's going to come in. He's well, he's a po- and that's what everybody, you know, he's a populist. He may be running under a GOP ticket, but he's a populist. I mean, he's probably, as far as that goes, he's on the, um, a Teddy Roosevelt plane. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt was a populist, right? And same thing, right? It's, and he had to do space force to, he had to have something to put his name on, right? He couldn't stand. <laughs> He couldn't build a new national park. He couldn't. Like, admit, that symbol, though, that it's beautiful. That's oh, he stole it. I'm surprised. You know, Star Trek ain't saving. You know? well, I heard Star Trek though got their symbol from Trump, uh, <laughs> from from the government, actually. So, well, I can believe that there was. I used to work for Floor Corporation for years, and they had this project. So they had a project basically back in the '60s. Um. The government had NASA had come to and said, "Can you engineer a a moon base?" Back in the sixties, and Floor had had a whole team of people on that, and they did all the engineering stuff for it. Uh, and they, they handed it over to government, and what you know, they never did anything with it, of course, that we that we know of. They, they were the ones who built the studio set. No, I'm just kidding. Ah. I don't know. I, I don't. You know. I believe. I believe we went to the moon. Okay. <laughs> Um, I also me, me too. Will yeah, say, sure. yeah. <laughs> but I also will say that I think we went to the moon, but I don't doubt that we had video problems up there, so they recreated it on the ground because those videos are a little bit iffy. <laughs> yeah, I've looked at them. You know, I wouldn't doubt that it was a combination of both, or we went one time we didn't go three or four times like they want us to think. You know, it's, it's kind of bang for the buck. Yeah, they were just messing with the Soviets. It's convenient. Yeah, you know, if they wanted to win the space race. Yeah. It's convenient that they went to the moon before cell phones, right? And that's how we can verify if things are real, right? And astronaut would take one there on the moon. Right? Analog, man. Analog. They did all that with analog. The, the space shuttle program itself only had, the space shuttle only had a 200 megabyte hard drive operating system. Right. And you know, and the way that the flat earth is tilted, you know, how can you uh, escape the, uh, towards the moon? It's such a... Well, they, back, see, they go in at a 45 and they hit the dome at, at the right angle and it propels them. You know, it's kind of like a ricochet. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. I mean, before we get into JFK, because I'm my name's John Kennedy, so before we get into conspiracies, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've got plenty locked and loaded. <laughs> now, before we do that, we better uh, we better call it, right, Cal? Yeah. Um, when the boog hits, you'll be joining us, right? <laughs> Anytime, bro. Hey, but here's one question. Yeah. Two, two, three, three, oh eight. Oh, three, oh eight, all the way. 
That's me. I'm a 308 guy. Nice. I knew we had a connection. <laughs> Whatever I, I can pick up off the ground. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dojo. It's been a pleasure. Keep up the good work. Yes, sir. Thank you. For those watching, stay liberated. Get off my property. Print guns. Thank you, guys.